Which one are you going to go for? Aesthetics? Performance. The choice is yours. A few quick disclaimers. We are going to be talking about building a home theater or putting together a home theater. And so I am making the assumption that this is going to be for a dedicated room because a living room just has too many compromises. And I know that's not all of us. And some of this stuff will pertain, but I am entering that mindset of putting together a home theater in a dedicated space. So that's the first disclaimer. Second disclaimer is I'm going to say some stuff that's going to ruffle a lot of feathers. And some of you will start getting mad telling me in the comments, I don't know what I'm talking about. And I should go, you know, do something bad to myself or just unsubscribe or maybe you will subscribe. I don't know. Let me let you in on a little secret. Come here. Come here closer. I don't care. Okay. There you go. Do you. So that's the other disclaimer, performance versus aesthetics. Which one are you going to lean in toward? So do you want a really nice looking home theater or do you want something that sounds accurate? Accurate in, in a sense, like as the artist intended. I hate that phrase, artistic intent. I hate it. We, we can talk about that later. Are you going for what the artist intended or are you going for aesthetics? Because if you don't want to see any speakers, chances are you're going for aesthetics, right? And depending on your room, that may or may not detract from the performance of the sound system, right? Because essentially, at the end of the day, it doesn't matter what you have for a display. It could be a TV, it could be micro LED, it could be a projector. The sound is what makes the movie. The sound system is what gives you those feelings. What are you going for? Aesthetics or performance? Let me give you an example. There's a Best Buy around here. Pretty nice. They had a 7.1.4 Dolby Atmos room, but they did something odd. They did something odd, and that kind of brings up this whole performance versus aesthetics thing. Their ear level speakers were actually not at ear level. They were lower than ear level. So they're kind of down in front. Then the rear surrounds were kind of next to us, and the surround backs were above, <clears throat> like just further back and above. And I thought that was kind of odd. I asked them to play some of my Atmos mixes. And I know from my Atmos mixes, if I make a sound go from the front all the way to the back, I know what that's supposed to be like because I'm the artist. And what I intended was for that sound to stay on the ear plane and just go back. That's it, just go back. But due to the way this room was designed with the speakers going at this angle, that sound is now moving backward and above, moving through the room and up. Why is it doing that? That's because of the physical location of the speakers. Maybe they had an issue with the studs or they, there were some, maybe there was some ducting, maybe there were some pipes in the wrong location or in a bad location for you to put speakers in. So that's a perfect example. I made the sounds go flat on the ear level, but when I'm listening back in this theater, it's going back through the room, but it's going above. A lot of people had a second row of seating and then that second row was elevated, so they used an elevated surround soundstage. So here we are again. How are you going to have the proper, accurate, artistic intent when your speakers are now elevated? You're going to have the same sensation I had, where the sound is going back into the room and then all of a sudden jumping up and maybe jumping up another level. Who knows? Depending on how you have it all set up. If you want to have a better experience, a more accurate experience to, to where the artist intended it to be, there would be no elevated rear surround soundstage. If you want them to make it sound exactly like it was mixed, no second row or no elevated rear surround soundstage. Like I said, you can still have people back there. You just have your mother-in-law back there. She'll be fine. She'll be asleep throughout the movie anyway. Not a big deal. And of course, at the end of the day, you're not going to notice, right? You're not going to, you, you don't make the Atmos. So you're not going to notice that it's wrong in your room. But now you've watched this video, now you're going to know, hey, well, what would that have sounded like? It's one of those things, which came first is the, or no, it's the, uh, the tree falls in the desert and, you know, does it make an oasis if nobody's there? And when we're talking about Dolby Atmos, we cannot ignore the height channel placement. Now there's a whole bunch of information on the internet. Do what you want to do and whatever works for your system. Now, of course, from my vantage point as someone that makes Atmos and has been doing this for about three years now, I mean, I learned a lot. So did Joe. We both learned a lot making this. Over 200 Atmos tracks went into the development of this product, which has 160 Atmos tracks. And you can't make that much Atmos and not learn 
a whole bunch. And we did. We learned so much about it that, you know, I'm, I'm still amazed and I'm still learning so much more, especially with uh, the people I'm hanging out with who are insane Atmos mixers. I, I got to tell you guys, by the way, there is a live stream that's happening April 3rd. I'll put the link uh, in the description. Make sure you set a reminder for that one. It's going to be awesome. Now, this next part is going to be very controversial. If I wanted to, let's say, learn how to write a song, I would go talk to someone that makes songs, right? That writes songs. If I wanted to uh, bake a cake, I would go to somebody that makes cakes. So if I wanted to learn about Dolby Atmos, wouldn't I want to go to somebody that makes Atmos? With all due respect, I've been putting together and designing home theaters for the last 25, 30 years. Okay, cool. So you're, an, you're a designer. You design the rooms. Does that make you an expert in Atmos or room design? You might be an expert at, at designing the room, but are you an expert at Atmos? Or how about the people that actually do the construction, that actually make and build the home theater? Are they the Atmos expert or are they an expert at construction and all that stuff and making it look nice? Where does that, where, when, you, when you boil it down to the core, where is the expertise? And I am not claiming to be an expert. I, I've been producing music since 2005. I've been a gigging DJ for over 20 years. I've been a home theater enthusiast since the mid 90s. And I just so happen to make YouTube videos. Do I consider myself an expert when it comes to Atmos and Atmos mixing and creation? No, there's too much to learn. Let's say I wanted to bake a cake and I went to somebody and they showed me the recipe with all the ingredients to bake a cake and the directions to bake a cake. And they just say to me, oh, well, you get these ingredients together and then you put them together like this. That's it. That is that that is the level of their expertise just regurgitating what's on this piece of paper. I'm not going to blindly follow a piece of paper. I'm not going to just rely heavily on theory. I tested out everything in a practical fashion. I had two home theaters. One was the way I would set it up and one was via Dolby Spec. And there was so much disconnect in the two when I was creating and making Atmos content and then playing it back on the system that had the Dolby Atmos spec. The optimal high channel configuration, I think for most rooms, and this is a generalization, obviously, it's not gonna to apply to every room, it depends. Six high channels. I believe six high channels and you'll get a good representation of what's going on. Now, before we jump into that, we have to discuss a couple of things. You see the speaker right here? This uh, SVS speaker in the background here, the white one? How much Dolby Atmos metadata is in this speaker? Zero, right? Zero. Big fat zero. There's no Dolby Atmos metadata in the speaker. There's two speakers there, let's say in a left and a right. How much Dolby Atmos metadata is in that speaker layout? Zero, right? So where, where is this magical Dolby Atmos metadata? Where is it? In the computer. It's so simple. It is so simple. It's in the computer. It's in the Dolby Atmos render. It's very simple. And I know a lot of these you know, YouTube experts and self-proclaimed gurus, they want to overcomplicate something that's actually very simple. And if you were just to stop and think about it, oh yeah, this makes a lot of sense, what I'm about to say. If we take the Dolby Atmos renderer and play signals that will only engage a single speaker, this is what it looks like. Now this is seven speakers. You got front left, center, front right, surround right, surround back right, surround back left, surround left. Now this gives you great coverage. Agreed? Can we all agree on that at least? This gives great coverage. So why not mimic what we have down on the ear level above and get the same amount of coverage minus, of course, the center channel. And what does that give us? That gives us a 7.1.6 Dolby Atmos configuration. If we have great coverage already for the ear level, then we can have great coverage up on the top. Now, of course, a lot of the experts and a lot of the people that follow the experts and just regurgitate what they say because they regurgitate something that Dolby says are going to say, well, it's all about angles. Listen, if you have the proper coverage, you'll have all the angles covered. Let me say it again. If you have proper coverage, you're going to have all the angles covered. Oh, well, Dolby only says we need to have, you know, speakers that are halfway to the main listening position in ceiling. But if you look at Dolby's own diagram here, it contradicts itself 
right here in the same page. Where's the main listening position in this diagram? Is it at the center? No, it's not in the center. It's a little bit back. We look at this diagram over here on the same page. Where's the main listening position? It's in now in the center. But in this other diagram on the same page, it's telling you something different. Like that is pretty confusing to begin with. 7.1.6, I feel is the optimal, and I'll tell you why. If we have something on the screen, like a helicopter, helicopter takes off, what direction does that go? It goes straight up. So that sound needs to stay in the front of the room. If you have a Dolby Atmos spec where the speaker is, let's say, half the distance between the main listening position and your front stage, spec from Dolby's own diagrams, that sound is going to travel up and towards you into the room. Now, of course, you're going to be like, no, Techno Dad, that's not what happened. But like, I think it was two years ago, I put out a video with an Atmos file that you can try out in your system. And there were hundreds, I think over 600 comments. And they answered in the way I assumed they would. Hey, I thought it sounded pretty cool. But what you said was right. The sound went up and toward me into the room. Now, I don't know what you guys think, but I know right away, like my brain's gonna be like, something's wrong with this. The helicopter's on screen, but the sound is now above me. And the helicopter's not above me. This just, it's up. The sound needs to stay where the helicopter is. You know, I was speaking with Nick Reeves, uh, who's a Grammy-nominated Atmos mixing engineer. He does all the Atmos mixes for Phineas, Billie Eilish. He did the entire Bob Marley collection. I was talking to him about this phenomenon and he 100% agreed. And he said that in music, it doesn't matter so much. It doesn't matter so much because there's nothing to tie everything to the front of the room. But when it's a movie and you have a screen and you have to attach the sounds to things happening on screen, you need to have that sound stay at the front of the room. There was some uh, talk about this uh, in another like Facebook group, and this guy was like, well, that's just an isolated incident. Nobody professionally that mixes Atmos puts any sound in the corners. So I got to spend some time with a guy named Alan Meyerson. Now, you probably haven't heard of this guy's name, uh, but you've heard his work as he's done the immersive mix for Sherlock Holmes and uh, what was that new one? Oh, yeah, Dune and Dune 2. I got to talk with him. I, I even helped this guy, right? Oh, and he said my name like totally funny too. Techno dad! Yeah. <laughs> I always get a kick out of that. And we're talking and we're, you know, laughing and high-fiving and all this kind of stuff. I got to hear a lot of his mixes and look, look at the renderer from his mix that's actually in a movie. Look at this. You want to tell me they're not going to use every centimeter of this box? Come on. Let's be real. And it's nothing against these people that have been, you know, designing home theaters for years. Like, I understand it's tough to like accept new information. It's like, it's like me telling, telling everybody that the world is round <laughs> when everybody thinks it's flat. So I guess, I guess you guys got to decide, are you a flat earther or do you, do you believe that the earth is round? I mean, this is, this is what we've got like now come, come down to damn people, you know, accept everything as, as it is. And then they tell a big company tells them something. Oh, okay. Yeah, sure. This is it. ABC XYZ. Right. And they just can't take in this new information. They just can't, they just refuse and they refuse to even just Try it. I, I, you know, don't take my word for it. Try it. Download my Atmos track and 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 try it. I'll put it down in the the description. It's from like years ago. And there is just a huge disconnect with the people that make and design home theaters and people that actually make and mix Atmos. There's a huge disconnect. And I'm here to tell you, I'm the guy in the middle. I'm the missing link. <laughs> I'm here to tell you that there's a lot of similarities and all we have to do is just take a little bit from here and a little bit from here and boom, we're going to have a better experience once we start listening to both disciplines and taking into account the problems in, in both and finding a solution. And so I think the solution is to mimic the speaker layout in your home theater that's derived from the Dolby Atmos renderer. Because again, there is no Dolby Atmos metadata in that speaker behind me. There is no Dolby Atmos metadata in the speaker configuration. The Dolby Atmos metadata is in the computer. It's in the computer. If the computer in the Dolby Atmos renderer has a specific location where if you play a sound, it fires in just that one speaker alone, why not mimic those locations into the home theater? This is very simple. Very simple. This makes a ton of sense. If we have seven ear-level speakers, 
Let's remove the center channel. So we have six, three on the left side, three on the right side. That gives us good coverage. So why not mimic that up top to give us good coverage? Seems very simple. I'm not here to overcomplicate something simple like everybody else. I'm telling you exactly what I'm seeing. There is a disconnect. And I think this will now unify this disconnection between the creation of Atmos and the reproduction of Atmos in your home theater. I think this is it. I think this is the answer. You let me know what you think. Which one are you going to go for? Aesthetics? Performance? The choice is yours. See you in the next one. Peace.